All right, guys, thank you for joining us. I don't know how much traction this is going to get because it's not going to be a video about why the Fuji X-H2S is the best camera that's ever been made. Instead, it's going to be about why cameras may not matter. I'm here with a couple of new friends who are both significantly better photographers than I am, and they've been using um, some challenged gear, let's say. And I think it's pretty interesting to see that some of the most stunning photos that I've seen uh, floating around the bird community in the last year have come from sensors and and kits that you would not think that. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you want to get into an argument about why uh, I think the A1 is overpriced or or whatever my feelings are on crop sensors, that's another video for another time. But today I want to introduce uh, a couple of people who are going to blow your mind. So we've got uh, Shay from Brampton, right? Yes, right. You're a Canon guy? I'm a Canon guy. That's right. For life, you think? I think the R7, but uh, uh, you know what? It could be for life. I mean, I'm, I've been so used to it. Um, if, ever since I had my little point and shoot, I just got used to the system. So when I went DSLR, I just stuck with it. And now it's same with mirrorless. So. Yeah. What's that like? Just having so much loyalty to a brand. Not like, I'm just, like I, I, I just get out, <laughs> knock on every door. I knew about, about that. <laughs> Uh, it is just familiarity, so it's just one less thing that I have to learn. I, I don't think there's a whole but a big difference between all the different systems. I just, I think you, you know, I stuck to what, uh, which, which is what most people do. Just stick to what they know and uh, what's you know familiar with them. So it's just one less hurdle to jump over. And high level spoiler alert: R seven. You've had it for what a, a month, a couple weeks. Yeah, maybe a few weeks now. Yeah, yeah. Is so, it good? Uh, I'm loving it though. Yeah, I'm loving it. I mean, when you jump from a, a DSLR like the 6D, which is you know not really a wildlife camera and not really that new, to to mirrorless, everything is going to be amazing. So I, I mean, I I know some people have hiccups here and there. I have no complaints. It's all it's all been good. That's good. So today, um, we're going to get a little bit of experience about you've moved to. So I mean, you've got some interesting gear. I mean, you shot the 6D and the Sigma. And now you've went to yeah. like high performance autofocus and you've been shooting the 300 to eight for a while, which is, so you've kind of like had both ends of the spectrum and our friend Alex had to, had to miss tonight, but he shot everything under the sun from Canon and has evaluated all of our photos until we're, we're just ripped apart and <laughs> in our little corners of the internet. So, I mean, I think it is interesting. People who believe that you can only get good photos with, with the top sensors are wrong. And, and that brings me to my friend Kareem, who's shooting a drone um but with an EVF on it really well you've got a one inch sensor that's like that's what my Mavic 2 Pro has it's I could just walk around with my drone and like take yeah. your pictures right yeah that, that's the only camera I've, I've ever used so that's all I know and I I love it and when you bought it you told me an interesting story you almost bought what a P1000 yeah P1000 because before buying a camera I was taking uh, photographs with my phone through uh, binoculars <laughs> that's what get got me started and uh so anything would be an upgrade at this point so i was like maybe i get a a p a p thousand and i just have like a big zoom and i can just you know snap photos of birds or i can get the sony which is a bit pricier uh, is the the sony rx10 uh but i get you know more photo value out of it so I ended up taking this one and it had some nice uh, video uh, functions too, which I liked. So I ended up picking up this one and I'm pretty happy with it. Well, it's interesting because I'm quite comfortable declaring you the best RX-10 4 shooter on the planet, I think, at this oh, point. <laughs> and I have to say, when I, I walked into the house one day and I looked at my R5 and, and I had the 100 to 500 and it was sitting on the table and... There was a time when it brought me so much joy. And then one day I looked at it and my gut turned and I just started seeing green dollar signs and thinking, wow, that's so much money tied up in a kit. And especially the lens. I loved the camera the whole time. But when I spent all that money on the lens and I didn't like it, I started getting really bummed out. And I had always wondered about that little Sony. And, you know, I, I wanted something I could stash in the truck and just bring it with me all the time. So I sold it and I went and bought a used RX-10 and I'm like, all right, if Kareem can nail this, I'm going to nail this. Here we go. And then I got it home and I couldn't get good pictures out of it. And all of a sudden I realized 
maybe Kareem's really good and I'm just not that good. It's just not that easy. And the flip side is I also still own a 6D. So as you guys are showing these images, now I never shot wildlife on the 6D. I just had a wide angle. But even like recently when I was camera less, I shot the 6D. I took some like pictures of my kid and I couldn't even get those to work. So I don't know how you were taking pictures of ducks. Like I, I can barely even get it to take a picture, let alone like a good picture. So so that's what this is about. I want to dive in and like really show show some people watching this how much oomph you can get out of the kit that you work if you really apply yourself to it. So who wants to go first? And let's uh, maybe we'll alternate and go back and forth one for one here. I can go first. Perfect. This, this is like getting turning into a work call where I have to like nominate. <laughs> All right, cool. So I'll just go ahead with the first shot. That's a seagull? Exactly, yeah. Right. Uh, it's actually a spotted sandpiper, uh, juvenile. And uh, okay, so the the ISO was uh, six, uh, 640. Okay. Exposure time was one six hundred and fortieth of a second. Okay. F4. So, and that's the max you can get on that camera? Uh no, I can't. You uh, F four, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, I can go to f two point four, but not at the uh, six hundred millimeters. Right. Okay. But if so I was you... to, uh, if I was totally on zoom, I would go to uh, I could go to two point four. So when did you take this? This was a uh, last week or a little bit less than a week. So it was a uh, during the morning, and uh, here the bird is pretty much in the shade. But because I had like very good proximity with it, I was laying low and it came pretty close to me. I think it was, I, I was actually pretty amazed at the uh, the amount of detail I got in this one. I applied uh, some uh, some sharpening in, uh, in Lightroom, but yeah, I was pretty impressed because the light was not directly hitting the bird. As you can see, it's hitting like the rocks behind. Right. So I was pretty damn glad with it, honestly. It so soft. how far was it, the bird, do you think? like a few feet like maybe five feet or something pretty that close. helps <laughs> well, and that's one of the things like oh sorry so i assume like you didn't crop this much then right not this one not a lot i cropped it a bit but it's not like a major crop like some of the other shots i will show later right well and it's interesting like just it's just seeing this like you crop. said you you can see the sharpness you can see the background is blown to bits and that's I don't even know what the equivalency would be, but I mean, on a one inch sensor, like you, like you said, when you get a subject that close in separation, like you're going to obliterate a background no matter what it is, right? Yeah, definitely the proximity deal for this sensor to work really. You really need that close proximity for sure. And you shot this on a $10,000 A1 with a $20,000 600 F4 lens, right? $30,000 kit? Yeah, yeah, totally. But, okay. <laughs> All right, perfect. So, okay, here's one win for full frame flagships. Oh, sorry, this was an, on an RX10, though. You mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then uh, maybe maybe the so-called experts might be a little wrong on this one. So let's see what else you got. So this one is you know, <laughs> it's not the greatest IQ, but it's just to show that you can do some action stuff with it. It's not like comparable to newer systems i'm sure i haven't tried any anything new so i cannot compare but it it does hunt a lot you know it, it gets off the target uh, you really need the background to be really far away so it's not optimal but with this sandpiper again it was pretty cool because he was flying to a nest i think i didn't see the nest but he was like doing pretty regular flight paths and so i just had to set up and he was you know just passing in front of the tripod, which allowed for uh, for better odds. Because, you know, when I just walk down and I'm in the forest and see birds flying, I rarely get the shots, but I really need that, like, super, uh, how do you say, like, a certain recurrency of, uh, of events. Sure. Like, you really need to have, like, like, a flight path that I can predict a little bit. Well, it's and funny because that's, that, yeah. that, that's something I've learned from both of you already, like, watching your shots and results and – it's quite clear like you apply a lot of subject knowledge and you're in the right place at the right time. And it's not from luck. It's from 
you know, re- repetition and learning where to go and learning what you're after. So how do you track with that? Like what's it, you don't have eye tracking in that, but I mean, the RX-10 has a pretty good auto yeah. system for what it is. There is an eye tracking for mammals and, <laughs> and humans and birds will work sometimes. I had it work for uh, robins, like when I get super close, but the tracking is pretty rough. Honestly, I, I don't think it's super good. I usually like don't go for birds in flight that much because I find it kind of frustrating. Like swallows is super hard with my with my setup, but you know, like I said, when I found a, like a, a cooperative subject with a flight path that I can somehow like figure out, that helps a lot for sure. But I wouldn't like recommend a kit for for action shots like birds in flight and stuff. So Shay, you've got a lot of experience with with shorebirds. Like, what do you what do you see when you look at these? Uh, you know, can, can you tell it's a small sensor? Um, what, like, what are your thoughts? I mean, this is uh, one of my favorite shots from Kareem because I mean, he, he nails the the action shot. And the mouth is open as it's calling, uh, and you know, the background is just you know really really nice, and I think he edited it really well. Um, and for me, like I look at this, and I, you can't tell that this is tell, taken on a one inch sensor. I mean, you can only have. Uh, sure, if you had, like you said, an A1 with a 600 F4, would you get some more better detail? You know, I may, possibly if you nailed the shot and whatever. But um, I think it, it it really shows uh, you're you're really pushing the capabilities of of that camera. That's not really meant to track th- these kind of subjects. I mean, if anyone has in, has seen a spotted sandpiper and seen how small they are, <laughs> you'll know how incredible this is. And also the fact that. They don't fly at eye level, right? They fly pretty low to the ground, usually, typically, anyway. So um, I think a recurring theme you're going to hear from uh, from Kareem and and from myself too is understanding the birds and uh, and knowing uh, their behaviors and 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 um, and watching them and studying them and and uh, being able to react and, and predict what's going to happen sometimes, uh, just to overcome some of the limitations that uh, we were working under. Uh, so I think he did. I mean, he think I think he did awesome. Like I said, I think this is one of my favorite shots from him. So uh, I I can't really um, I would never you know discount this because you know it was shot at an RX10 um, because it doesn't matter because I think the impact is there. Well, and and I think you know that's that's kind of why I wanted to have this discussion because I mean I'm I'm obviously building this channel so far on Fuji reviews. But I've had a lot of people as detractors saying, well, hey, the camera, the autofocus sucks and the camera can't track this and can't do that. And I'm sitting here thinking it's got to be user error. You know, I'm not, I'm not sitting claiming that it's it's the most powerful autofocus system that's ever existed. But I am sitting here saying I couldn't get this shot with Kareem's camera and I probably couldn't get this shot with an A1 or my Fuji. So it really does still, no matter how smart your camera is, it still comes down to your skill. And it's it's interesting, like you said, I mean, you guys are both examples of people pushing cameras to their limit, where I think a lot of people think they can like buy a crazy camera and it's just going to deliver the results automatically. Um, so, if, I mean, a message to anyone, if you want to get into bird photography, I, this video will hopefully show you that if your budget is tight, um, you know, you can do a lot of great things. Even, even the P1000 that Kareem chose this is a better version over, um, you know, I've seen some really nice bird shots out of a P1000 if you know what you're doing and, and you know where you can get away with it. So um, what else you got, Cream? Let's see some more. So this is a Magnolia Warbler. I was about to say that's a nice yellow rump. Um, <laughs> I was going to say I'm glad I kept my mouth shut, but I didn't. So, Well, it does have a yellow rump. It does. It does. How can you tell the difference just quickly? You have these um, these black bars here. And you have the whole uh, yellow belly, which right. uh, Magnolia doesn't, uh, uh, well, the yellow rump doesn't have the whole yellow belly. And the whole fa- facial pattern is like uh, a little bit different too. And quickly, uh, all warblers look the same. Can you confirm or deny? Correct. Correct. Okay, perfect. All right, carry on, please. All right. So I wanted to showcase this one because uh, I think it's really like the optimal conditions I could ever get. It was... Um, soft overcast light like about uh, nine or ten uh, in the morning but it was overcast and super bright still and i think this shows really the capabilities of what this camera can do when you have the right proximity again because 
observers I had observed for a few days when I went in the northern Quebec, and I noticed that they were often um, foraging in like a pretty linear path uh, in the often in the conifers, and I used often I placed in front of uh, the rows of trees and just waited and they would come pretty linearly. So again, important to like find a way to get close because my sensor had you know, a bit of difficulties when the subject is super far away. Yeah, proximity, right, like gets you the detail, right? Yeah, for sure. And when I don't get the proximity, I can just go for wider comps, which I don't think I've actually included here because you were like, you were like the maximum like details of my stuff. But, you know, when I don't get the proximity, I go for other type of compositions. And I think it's as fun and as cool. But right. when I do get the proximity, it's cool to see what the camera can do. I, I I'm a recovering crop addict for sure. I, I've like learned that cropping's just not not you you can't crop that crazy and expect image quality. And I think I'm I'm finally starting to clue into this. So you're right. If you don't if you don't have the detail, then just shoot it differently, compose it differently, take a different picture. Don't force something that's not there. Right. Yeah. All right. What do, what do you got on the sparrow? All right. So this is a really ridiculous crop. Can you see? Yeah, your cloud storage uh, is almost full. <laughs> I, I don't know if Adobe's oh, letting you know. You, you owe Adobe I, some money. I know your opinion on this. <laughs> Flickr, baby. Yeah. The only cloud you need. <laughs> Flickr Pro. So that this is the crop I did. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit much. That's not a heavy crop. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what are you talking I mean, about <laughs> i don't think that's a heavy crop either but i guess it really depends on the center right that's true to me that was pretty heavy <laughs> if if the sparrow was the size of his foot and you cropped him in to be that big that's what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah <laughs> well Is that even a hundred percent you're classic yeah, no. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought it was huh that's not even a hundred percent i don't know uh, it doesn't look like it <laughs> That wasn't too bad. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't a. I wouldn't say it's a light crop, but it's not. I wouldn't call it heavy. I think fifty percent is probably All right. like heavy, and I, I don't think that was fifty. This is why Kareem has good image quality because he thinks that's an insane crop. He, well, he, I think that's. Like, I think that's closer. part of it too, right? Yeah, I think that's part of it too. You got to work with what you have. If if you're only shooting with a you know eight megapixel ca camera, you, you can't be you know cropping at fifty percent. Um, so I think that's just part of the, you know, using the tools you have and the gear you have and working with that. Now, if you have a 50 megapixel camera, um, and you can get away with the crop because you're shooting with a really high quality lens, then, uh, you know, all power to you, but you know, you're still going to suffer some image quality, uh, some image quality degradation at some point. Yeah, for sure. Well, and it just seems like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, <laughs> What, Kareem, get get your stuff pulled up. And in the meantime, an anecdote, when I was first shooting with Fuji, I had the 100 to 400 lens and Matt and I would drive around looking for snowy owls. Um, and, and he kind of taught me a little bit about it. And, and I decided that the trick to shooting snowy owls in fields was just to put a 2X teleconverter on the Fuji 100 to 400 lens, which dropped it to five. So it would have dropped it to 800 at F11 on a crop body. So I, I was like 1200 millimeters. Yes. And then I took it out into the field and the snowy owl just looked like a melted snowman. Uh, and I mean, this snowy owl was like on the other side of the farmers. Like it was so small, you know, when you see them and you're like, is that a bag on a tree across the field? Right. And you pull up the yeah. binoculars and you're still not sure. I thought I should be able to take a good picture doing that. So I've learned, but I think I bought three 2X teleconverters in my journey thinking it's the next one that's going to be the magic 2X. Mm -hmm. So nothing yet, but this is a nice crop cream. You did a good job. Yeah, thanks. Uh, all right, let's see the next one. So this one is a, it's a marsh wren. I thought it had a nice uh, depth of field. You can see the tail is all blurry up there. And it's, it's kind of getting uh, gradually blurry as it gets to the tail. And uh, it was during harsh light too, which is a type of light I do not really enjoy on this uh, on this camera. I feel like it often uh, turns detail into plastic and it renders a bit weird. 
but I thought in this shot it looked pretty good. I thought the rays were hitting the, the eye just fine. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy about it. Looks good. Yeah, it looks good. Looks great. Nice little, nice little munchy there. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I mean, look at the detail in the face when you zoom in. That's that's really impressive. Yeah. Maybe what I'll do is actually, uh, maybe we can put these in the uh, the Flickr group so people can see them at like high res. That might be a good yeah. spot for them. Sure. And then they can yeah, zoom yeah. and like pixel peep and rip us all a new one. <laughs> just, just go for it. Um, okay, so Kareem, in summary, um, are you are you going to shoot with an RX10 forever? And if the answer is no, then what would you say? Forget about specific cameras, maybe, but like, what are some upgrades that you think would be important to you versus things that aren't? Because I, I also think it's interesting. Like when we talk about gear you're just as interested in like buying a kayak so you can get to distant islands or spending that money on travel instead of a gear. So, so, I mean, talk a little bit about that, but, but I mean, people want to hear the gear. So talk a little, like what, yeah. if you were going to upgrade, what are some, some upgrades that would be important to you and some things that you might not care about that everybody kind of likes? All right. So first of all, I, I don't think I'm going to sh the shoot the, the RX-10 forever, but I do think I'm going to use it for a while still. I don't think I'm going to upgrade in the next years because I think I have kind of figured out what I can do with it and what I cannot do with it. For example, I've tried shooting uh, Harriers a lot with this camera in fields and I had like a hard time. It was not It was not fun. Same thing for Swallows. I had a terrible time. So I suppose like I could... I could with more AF and more software, faster lens, you know, just something to shoot some birds in flight would be fun. Um, now for the brands, I'm not quite sure yet, but I, I, I'd probably get a 100 to 400 cam. If maybe it's going to be Canon, maybe it's going to be Fuji. I'm not quite sure yet, but I, I do not have like deep love for Sony or something. I just love this camera and I'm going to have to try other cameras to see. Well, it really is cool. And I I honestly, I don't think there's any examples. Uh, I mean, because when I bought the camera, I did a lot of YouTubing. And, and there's a guy, I think, in the UK who does some pretty cool street and landscape photography with the RX-10. But I really didn't see any wildlife examples. So hopefully, at least one person out there who either owns it or is shopping for it can look at this and realize, like, it's a really powerful little camera. Um, you know, don't let the single lens option fool you. I mean, it's a, all the reviews say that it's a very sharp lens. Um, and it's really cool having something that can do what 24 millimeters all the way up to 600 in your pocket. And for yeah, me, that was the draw. I said, yeah. Yeah. That was a draw for me when I bought it. As I said, I like landscapes and I like portrait shooting of, of people in my studio and I, and wildlife is my number one. So a camera that can do everything and always be with me. Um, st I'm still interested, you know, if Sony comes out with an RX 10 five and it was really, really good at a decent price, it still sounds like a camera that I would love to just always have in the car or something. Right. Like, I mean, I've started bringing my Fuji kit to work and stuff. And I mean, it's, it's still relatively compact, but I don't like having it sit in the car and worrying about it and taking up space and it's still kind of heavy and it's kind of delicate. So, um, what do you think, like, I guess, sensor wise, do you, do you, I mean, you're shooting a one inch sensor getting incredible wildlife results. So do you, do you think there's a lot of importance to you between full frame or APS-C or micro four thirds? Um, you know, if, mm. if you were shopping tomorrow, would, where would you value like autofocus versus portability and price? Where, where do you, where's your head at? I definitely value portability a lot, especially when I'm on the shore and I like to have you know, small movements to move the lens around. I, don't, I I wouldn't see myself carrying a huge lens when I'm shooting uh, something like spotted sandpipers. I could, but I guess I wouldn't be crazy about, about it. Hikes in the, in the mountains and stuff. I like having a small camera, but definitely having better AF. I've missed so many shots that could have been made easily with like a bit of a faster system, I think. And uh, yeah. I think really, I I don't think full frame would be like that important for me because I grew up anyways. Uh, so yeah. All right, you guys heard it here first. Kareem's first in line for a Fuji X-H2S. He declared it the perfect camera, portability, great autofocus, bursts, 
all those Harrier shots. He'd just be nailing them. Fuji, Fuji, Fuji. That is exactly – that's what I heard. I don't know if that's what Shea heard, but. Oh, Mike, I, I, you're, I think you're hearing something. I think you would hear what you want to hear. Well, I have like a Fuji earbud in here that just like tells yeah, me yeah. To promote Fuji. Gotcha. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about all of these. Uh, I haven't actually talked about, um, but I just wanted to showcase some of the photos I started um, with using the Sigma. So shooting the Sigma 150 to 600 contemporary with uh, Canon 6D. Um, I'm not sure how old the 6D is, probably about maybe about. Uh, that's what I had when I was into other types of photography. So I just started using it. And, so what happened? Uh, you, you had the 6D and then you wanted to get into birds. So you bought a Zoom, but you already yeah. had the 6D. Yeah, exactly. So I just figured I'd slap the Sigma on it. And, you know, I didn't have bins either. I didn't have binoculars. So I was like, uh, I need to see the bird at least. And uh, so the one the 150 to 600 was appealing because of the reach and the, and the price, of course. So. Um, but then as you, you know, I thought I would just go out because, you know, I was into photography. I could take photos, right? I took photos of people and buildings and whatnot. I can take photos of birds. So I started mm -hmm. to go out and then realized it wasn't as easy as, uh, so, uh, I had to practice with it to get better. Um, but you know, it, it, it's a capable lens in the right situation. Um, just like Kareem, um, and with anybody really proximity is key. So. The closer you are, the more details you get. And so um, earlier on for me, it was um, just trying to get as close as possible and trying to get lots of feather detail and, and so on. And um, I was happy to just walk around and bird and, and see, you know, what was around and whatever happens, happens. Um, like this woodcock that I happened to just run into one day and um, I froze. And I was able to, you know, without it moving, get, you know, nice and close. And um, I stopped down just a little set point one to make sure I could get some detail. Um, but eventually I just started shooting uh, wide open more and more. And so, um, you know, it was, it's, you know, maybe six, seven feet away here. Um, and so I got a nice look at that one. That's um, really cool. Sorry, say that again? That's really cool, like the mud on the beak and everything. That's yeah, and the yeah, bird. Yeah. I mean, you don't see those <laughs> very often. Yeah, that's yeah, really that's true. It's gorgeous. I mean, I I haven't seen one since, and this was uh, last year. <laughs> I haven't seen one uh, uh, since then. So just I didn't realize how lucky I was. I was pretty new to birding at that point. Now that's a forest shorebird, right? It's yeah, that's what they call it, the forest shorebird, because it's not actually it's a shorebird since it's in the family, but you won't find it on a beach or in mud flats or anything like that. You find it in the on, on the edge of the woods, um, in leaf piles just like this. In fact, like <laughs> I was making a bad joke, so that's that's crazy. <laughs> no, no, that's actually no, <laughs> seriously, they, they call it that, yeah. No, really. Um I was looking at the habitat walking by and I was I was thinking actually at the time like this is like really good habitat for a woodcock and then boom it was right there. It was actually a crazy, crazy day. But he's like um, today I'll live here. <laughs> exactly. Uh so yeah, I spent a lot of time trying to get close to birds and um or at least I I started getting close to birds and then I realized it was easier if I just let birds come close to me. But either way, the proximity was so important and um, at you know the at the wide at the zoomed in lens or uh, the zoom in end of the lens the aperture is max aperture is six point three, which um, is a little troublesome in terms of you know obliterating backgrounds. So um, getting close again helps with that. So uh, this canvas back was on the beach and um, it came fairly close. I inched a little bit closer till I was happy with you know the proximity I was at and the details I was going to get. And uh, the light was a little bit rough. Um, but I kind of waited for some partial cover and, um, you know, got a, a, a nice picture, I think, of it. And, the, and the, because it was so close, the background kind of just melts away too, and even a, a little bit of foreground in there. Uh, and it was happy to just kind of chill and uh, do its thing. Um, and so I also find I got a lot of, you know, much better results when the bird wasn't moving <laughs> because 
uh, not only is the signal really um, slow at tracking or at changing um, its focus, the camera I have is also not really good for tracking either. The 6D is not uh, not really adaptive. It's only got 11 autofocus points and uh, only the middle one works. So <laughs> I was only shooting with that middle cross type because the other one's just not dependable. Um, it would hunt, yeah. it would hunt on the, on the middle one, but it really like hunted on the ones on the outside. So I just stuck to the middle one and then, you know, focus recompose. Your shooting is really interesting to me because there's been so many times, especially like when you change some gear um, where you'd, you'd post a photo and, and I didn't realize back then how many photos that you kind of go through about what you want to post and, and how critical of your work you are, which is, I think why it looks so good. And I would see you post something and I'm like, oh, wow, that 302.8 looks mm, so good. And then I'd read your caption and it's like Sigma. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I'm over here Googling 302.8s because I'm convinced. I'm like, oh, this is why Shay's pictures look so good. And then I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> this is this is on the old the old battle tank. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. I appreciate that line. Um but yeah, the, the, it's a capable lens. I, I you know, it's super sharp in the right. Um and if the background is far enough, like in this photo, like oh. the background is is miles away, not miles, but it's it's you know, a good half a kilometer away, maybe. Um you it just disappears. I even got a nice bokeh ball. That's right, right there. So um, these are houses. They're actually houses in the back. You can't tell um, because of how far away it is. And and uh, uh, actually, it, it popped up in front of me because um, I, I guess it's just being territorial, and it just stood there chirping at me. So um, I got a nice composition out of it, and um, it's a wide open uh, meadow, so nothing really distracting there. And, um, and, uh, you know, a pretty good sharp that's um, catch light and everything. So I didn't have to do too much to this photo. Um, these are all edited, of course. And, uh, you know, showing something straight at a camera is, is nice too. But I think it's important to know how far you can push your RAWs. Um, because at the end of the day, your RAW is just, you know, it's just a flat file that has a bunch of, you choose what you want to bring out. And some some cameras just do that better. Like even with the 300 now, it brings out highlights better than the Sigma does. So um, that changes the way I shoot too. With the Sigma, I could never really push my exposure uh, like I do now. I have to be pretty conservative because I had a tendency to blow out the highlights. Well, and I think that's a really important point too, because one thing, and maybe this is kind of endemic to Facebook, but on a lot of Facebook groups for gear and things like that, I see people talking about about certain aspects of cameras that they they usually don't like a lot of complaining and you'll see the sample shots. And the first thing I think is your shots aren't edited. And, and it's always like the first place my head goes, especially if someone's posting birds. And I think like you look at the settings and you look at the bird and you think right away, you can say, well, Hey, your shutter speed's way too slow. Like you're just, you're getting motion blur and then saying that the camera autofocus isn't good. Uh, and then you're, you're posting something straight out of camera and wondering why it doesn't look like, you know, one of your shots or something that's been, I mean, and it's not like you're editing, you know, the bejeebus out of your photos, but I mean, you, you are working them, like you said, and getting every bit of oomph you can get out of the file. So, I mean, I mean, I, I hate to, to say you have to edit if you want to shoot wildlife, but I mean, I think you do. I, I don't, I can't think of one photographer anywhere shooting straight out of camera wildlife shots that I, that I like. And even if I did, I, I still think they'd be better if that hypothetical person edited them. Do you guys agree or am I up the wrong tree on this? I agree. hundred percent. I think it, like you said, you bring out what you have seen in the scene, the moment you took the shot, you bring out what really matters. If the, uh, the rocks were glowing and it mattered to your eyes, you should bring that out in the image, I think. But you don't, you, sh you shouldn't. If you want, you can, and it's cool, I think. Yeah, no, I totally agree with what Kareem said. Like, you, there's something in the shot that you wanted to highlight, and you adjusted your camera to capture that as best as possible. So, you know, multiple times I will um, expose for, let's say, uh, the sky, the sky is really nice, and I want to make sure 
I get that sky color in there, I'll need to underexpose a little bit to get that um, sky color, knowing that the bird will be a little bit dark, but I can bring the bird back a little bit in post and maybe not make it super bright, but you know, I, I, if I really want that color, that's what I'm going to expose for. If I wanted to expose for the bird and blow out the sky, then, you know, that's what you choose. But um, either, and you might want to bring that sky back, right, if you did that. So I think your intention is very important when you're taking that photo um, because you you can't depend on the camera to choose how your photo is presented. Now, if you just want to, you know, power all power to you if you just want to shoot and this and post raws and 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 just you know you don't have, maybe you don't have time to edit you, you know it's overwhelming to think about all the stuff you have to do you don't have the skills it takes time to learn uh you know that's all that's all fine but like mike said i think if you really want to bring the most out of your photography you have to not only choose the settings to capture the image the, the scene that's in front of you you've also got to tell that capture detail in your post processing bring out what you want to bring out so that you um, can highlight what you want to highlight about that scene. Um, well, and that's, I think you, you raise a good point on editing being daunting too. Uh, you know, when I first got a camera, one of the reasons I don't, I think I didn't get a camera for so long is I would look at work and, and I knew I have a background in music production. So I, have, I had an idea that you have to, to do work on things, you know, to finish your art. And I realized at the time, I thought I had zero interest in editing. And all of my friends can attest that as soon as I started editing, I quickly fell in love with it. And it, I, I would almost argue I like editing almost as much as shooting in a lot of cases. Uh, but, but I think like you have to realize that wildlife photography is more than, than the sum of its parts. It's not just knowing how to control a camera. It's, as you guys said, it's knowing, I mean, your field craft and your species behavior is, is equally as important as, as your camera. I mean, I, I know how to expose a photo in my camera. I think as well as anyone who shoots a camera, but my photos don't live up to the quality of a lot of my peers at this point in time, because I know very little about a lot of the stuff I shoot. And to your point, I think my best photos are of species I feel the most comfortable with. And I know where, I mean, I've been, I've been having a good summer with loons. I still haven't gotten the photo I want, but every week I go out, especially spending time with the same birds, it's like I'm wasting less time finding the birds. I know what they're going to do, when, where, and where I can get the pictures I want. And all of a sudden I'm getting back to my computer thinking the pictures I took last week are so much better than the pictures I took in June um, with the same, you know, same kit or, or same type of camera. And, and I think editing is the same thing. If you're not going to put in the time to learning your species and you're not going to put in the time to learning your camera and you're not going to put in the time to learning editing, you can't leave one of those parts out and ex i mean i feel like it's a tripod of of legs right it's uh is that a, i don't know if that's if that's punny but uh, <laughs> but i don't i don't think you can leave one out without the other if, if you do yeah. then you certainly can't compare yourself to to like top tier bird photographers because that, i mean they're all doing all three of those things yeah and i think if you're spending thousands of dollars a year and and that's whether it's two thousand or ten thousand uh you you i think you owe it to yourself to like you said, get all those three aspects as good as you can get them so that you feel um, really, you know, you, you might feel good about your work and that, you know, nothing to, nothing wrong about that, but you could feel better and you could feel um, really proud, even prouder than you do now uh, if you have all those things put together. So, um, you know, I, I'll parlay that into um, this next uh, image here, um, which kind of puts all of those things together, I think, um, this fox sparrow, is really skittish, doesn't like to be around uh, people at all. And I had seen it a couple times earlier and it, as soon as it saw me, it just bounced. And so I decided to, and, and normally in early in my you know, birding journey, I would just be trying to get close, trying to get close, trying to get, I was trying to get as much detail as I can. But now I've kind of appreciated, I, I really appreciate you know, composing a scene rather than, you know, showing off other detail. And it uh, it's much more fulfilling for me uh, doing that now. And so when I saw it again, um, it didn't see me, but instead of trying to approach and get really, really close, uh, this is a, a, a decent crop. Um, I decided to just kind of hang back and let it be. I saw that there was this uh, streak of light coming in um, through the forest 
And I just kind of waited and uh, took pictures and hoping that it would cross into that little um, that little path. And luckily, my camera focused on it <laughs> when it did. <laughs> so while you know the image quality isn't like super sharp um, because it, it was very low light conditions, and um, I think I'm shooting at ISO 800 here, one five hundredth of a second. So not not too bad. Um, and uh, you know I wanted to get it in that spotlight. Uh, knowing that the rest of the scene was dark. If I had tried to, you know, expose the, the the what's behind the bird and all that stuff that's dark, you know, I could have blown out the whites and its feathers. A really kind of unpleasant, unpleasing image. Uh, but uh, I this is the feel that I wanted to create at the time. But I was only able to do it by understanding that the bird isn't going to get me. Uh, let me get close. Um, understanding that the scene that I wanted anyway in my mind requires me to um, cut, highlight uh, the spotlight on the bird. And, um, you know, I think I really uh, enjoyed how this, uh, and this is kind of a turning point for me, um, thinking about photos in this way. And I started to kind of really think about doing this more. And, you know, it's always nice to shoot in pretty golden light, but um, different lighting situations, kind of, you know, looking at things differently is uh, important too. Well, and this is an interesting picture because because what you talked about blowing out the color or the whites on the bird. Um, I was taking a break yesterday at at my backyard pond here, so I was sitting here and they're landing in the trees. They're being very photogenic and doing all these nice things, and I blew my exposure and everything. And the interesting thing is, like, I didn't blow my exposure so hard that you couldn't look at the photo, but I, I mean, as someone who's trying to take, I mean, obviously not a professional, but I'm trying to take this to like a serious hobby or enthusiast level. And I think, like you said, that's like what separates someone who's like trying to get a picture of a bird. Then you try to get a sharp picture of a bird. And then like you try to get a good picture of a bird. And when I brought in these photos and edited them, I'm like, well, they're not good because the white stripe on his chest is blown out. So even though the composition is pretty good and it's sharp and there's feather detail, the, I'm like, you can't save that. And, and it's, we've talked you and I about auto ISO and I've went on and on about how it's so good. And I still really do like auto ISO, but I think in this position, I, I should have been using my brain. I mean, the sun was kind of, it was weird because the sun was harsh, but the birds were popping in and out of the branches of a, of a spruce tree. So they weren't really in direct light, but it was just enough that if one little bit of light hit the bird, it just blew out all the whites. So, so my camera in auto ISO and in like matrix or photometry mode or whatever Fuji uses for subject detection, it, it was doing a good job. It exposed the scene really well, except that one little part that was like pretty critical. So this is really interesting because I, I totally see what you mean. I'm looking at your, your settings thinking like, uh, <laughs> I would have been at ISO 52,000. Like, <laughs> so it's really interesting to see this. And I'm thinking, wow, like what? What could have those photos have looked like had I calmed down, taken a breath and realized like, you don't need to rattle this off. Like these birds are going to be here as long as you want them to be. So why don't I take control and try to expose to something instead of, instead of planning to do it in post. And I think that's where I'm still learning. Like a lot of times I plan, I say, well, if I capture a good camera with, or a good photo with a good raw, then I can change what I want to later. And a lot of times you can, except when you can't, it's just, it's all gone. So I, I think this is an awesome example of doing it in the field and then and then pushing it where you want rather than hoping you can drag it there kicking and screaming. But I think your experience though is um, is just part of the, the learning curve uh, with your gear, right? Like you're realizing able to do what it likes to do, what these settings do in these situations. And then you learn from that. And I think, um, that's kind of uh, what we're talking about is just being able to use what you have and understand it so well that you're able to uh, dictate it, uh, what you want it to do next time. Maybe you right. make some mistakes, right? I, I learned to do this because countless times I've exposed for the bird and, you know, uh, a little bit of light hits a feather and completely blown out and, you know, ruins the whole photo. Um, so I've learned, you know, where to put my histogram in certain places, um, you know, with this kit. Um, I've learned that, you know, 
one five hundredths of a second is, you know, my sweet spot for making sure there's no camera shake. Um, I know how high to push my ISO uh, in terms of the amount of noise I get and whether it's, you know, worth it to push that high for that for this shot and then balancing that with my shutter speed as well. So I think that's all part of learning your gear and, and getting used to it. And, you know, now that you know that, next time that thing happens, you're going to either try a different setting or try a different exposure and, uh, you know, it'll work for you. So I think that's just part of the process. Now, could you talk a little bit about, um, and I don't know if you have any R7 stuff in here ready to go. If not, maybe maybe we can add stuff later. But going from the 6D to the R7s, forget the autofocus. Like going to mirrorless must be a pretty big change, being able to see things in an EVF. And so, are like, I mean, are, I'm someone who has never shot with a histogram. I've always used my eye in the EVF. And yesterday's mistakes made me wonder if the histogram would have saved my butt. Um, are you still using a histogram? Has the EVF changed your process? And, and you, I mean, so I know you said you like the R7. It's going well. Have there been any quirks that were kind of uh, eye-opening that were hard to overcome? And I mean, I, I know it's still new, but anything that's like, oh, wow, I, I didn't realize like this would kind of throw me a little. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I still shoot um, with my Instagram on and having it in the EVF is like a game changer. Like before with the 6D, I was taking a shot, you know, looking at the, the back of my screen, um, pulling up the, uh, if, you know, the histogram shows up on the preview and then, you know, adjusting based on that. Um, and, but, you know, I could, if I did that more than one time with the bird in front of me, forget it, the bird's mm -hmm. gone. I, you know, sometimes I don't even have to, a chance to do that. So even then I'm, you know, if I know I don't have a chance to check my histogram, I'm kind of guessing with my exposure um, uh, and, and where I think the camera is going to be. And again, that's just part of, you know, getting used to your camera and knowing what it's going to do. Um, so if I had time, yeah, check my histogram on the back and then, and then, you know, I make my adjustments and move forward. Um, but I, having it in the EVF, I mean, it's just, it's a game changer and just being able to keep that camera on my eye and make my exposure settings on the fly. Uh, even just to have it, it even feels, even though it's small, it just feels bigger and I can see, you know, um, that little, that little line at the, at the, at the, at the um, on the far right that shows that you're blown out because it's touching the edge. You know, I can see that a little better too. And that, you know, that saved me a couple of times. So and that's funny because um, I've never looked for that line ever. <laughs> I didn't gotta even... look for that line because that, that, if you're shooting a white bird, that little line is going to be the bird. <laughs> so right. you got to look for that little line at the bottom that's touching the right. Um, or even on, it might be a little higher up sometimes if it's a big bird, but. Um, I, if I can give an advice advice to intermediate shooters who are starting to like learn learn more things and stuff like that, uh, if you get used to reading a histogram and using that, I think you're you're gonna really re not only reduce the amount of um, you know, highlight blowouts, but you're also gonna be able to do things more creatively. Um, so, would you? I mean, this is it's a silly question, but if you if you had to pick between the autofocus improvements and just having an EVF, which one do you think has been more important to your shooting? Hmm. I mean, there's nothing like I can, without a histogram, I can still shoot. Even if it, even if I was, if I had no idea what the camera was going to do, I could take a test shot, see that it's too bright and I could, you know, darken it down. But ha having a camera that can actually get, uh, sustained, um, you know, pictures in focus <laughs> and be able to like have a choice of photos when I go out and shoot something is amazing. <laughs> like with the Sigma, I I'll be honest, I'm, you know, I, I push it in tough situations. I like to shoot in low light conditions, golden hour, foggy conditions, you know, things that are dramatic because, um, you know, it just, it's rare. And uh, even in overcast, sometimes it can be a little tricky, right? But if I go out and shoot in low light, I know that I'm going to get, you know, five pictures out of focus. And then I will slowly, um, as I keep going in the sequence, they'll get more and more and more in focus. And then hopefully by the 10th photo, I'll have one that's like really sharp. And hopefully that really sharp photo is a nice pose. 
with no distracting elements coming out the, the back of, of the bird and, and so on. So, uh, but now, you know, I have, you know, out of those 10 photos, you know, eight or sometimes, you know, nine or even all 10 that are in focus and I can pick and choose, uh, which brings its own problems because now I have like tons of photos, you know, that I have to go through and, and try to choose with, you know, it's a nice problem to have, but um, I would definitely keep the track, the, 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 uh, the autofocus um, over the histogram because I can, I can learn to use the, the camera without a histogram and, and understand how it's going to interpret the light, but there's nothing rep that can replace a camera that can actually focus and, and track things uh, that I would not change. Now, <clears throat> so here's another question. So you've upgraded your lens and your camera. Would you say, if you had to take one combo, would you take the 302.8 on the 6D or would you take the Sigma on the R7? Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> I've, I've always been, even before wildlife, I've always been a believer in investing in your lens over the camera. Uh, wildlife photography is probably one of the few situations where the how much weight is a little bit more, but I would still choose having the 300 with the 60 over having the Sigma with the R7. And uh, having, having used the 300 with the 60, um, I know that I can recreate, you know, uh, really good images. Um, and even though the camera struggles really to um, to match what the 300 can do, um, I know I can still use it. Uh, having the R7, I've never used the Sigma on the R7. Um, I, I sold it, so I don't even have it anymore. But I'm not convinced that I would be able to get that same level of uh, focus and clarity and um, the way it treats backgrounds uh, with that Sigma, especially in lower light conditions. Uh, not, I'm not convinced. So I would take my, my old combo 60 and 300, definitely. So what, what is it about the, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but do you think there's a, a myth that when someone buys a 300 2.8, they're always shooting it at 2.8? Like, what would you say is your average aperture? You find yourself shooting that lens and if my hypothesis is not way off base and you're shooting it at 5.6 or something closer to the Sigma, then what are the benefits that the 300 is giving you over the Sigma if it's not shooting it that fast, you know? Yeah. I, I think if you're buying a 300 eight, especially for wildlife photography, you're buying it because it's 2.8. And when I use the two point, when I use the 300 bear with no teleconverter, I'm pretty much always shooting it wide open. Okay. And that's because I so I, I have a I have a 1.4 TC and a 2x. So I pick and choose whether I'm going bare 1.4 or 2 based on the lighting conditions that I'm going into and how far away I think my subjects are going to be. So if I'm walking into a, a forest, um, I know that the subjects are that I can see are going to be close. Uh, I know it's going to be, you know, very low light. So I'm walking in there. If I'm going into a large field, um, then, you know, I'll bring my 2X with me and um, depending on the lighting conditions, uh, I, I'll be able to, I'll, I'll have to, you know, manage my settings there. Um, the 1.4 is kind of, you know, in between and, and, you know, I have certain situations where I use that too. Uh, and so with the 1.4, I'm also pretty much shooting wide open at F4. Um, with the 2X, I'm definitely not shooting wide open. Uh, I found that the depth of field is just too narrow so I stop down to f8 instead of wide open at 5.6, and I get much more keepers. Uh, the, as long as I position myself well and the backgrounds are far enough away, my backgrounds are still nice. Um, it, it's a little bit trickier in low light because I have to watch my shutter speed. Um, I, I pretty much have to keep it high because my effective depth of field is so long. It's like 960, so um, I'm shooting. I try to. Keep Keep it around one over a thousand <laughs> uh, per second, um, and uh, or one over a thousand seconds. You know what I'm saying? Um, just to make sure that I don't have any camera shake. But I'm that's me just starting out with the two X uh, and trying to get used to it and making sure I can consistently produce uh, nice images. 
I will, as, I, as I'm learning, I've figured out my, my kind of sweet spot for apertures around F8. And so as I get comfy with that, um, especially walking around, I'm going to start pushing that shutter speed down to see if I can bring my ISO down because um, having that F8 really cuts back the amount of light that I'm used to shooting with. So using a higher ISO um, to compensate for the high shutter speed and low aperture. So, I mean, there's a lot of, you guys have both shared so many awesome images <clears throat> and great information. Uh, let's add on a, let's end on a sour note. So uh, two minutes to each of you about what you don't like about your gear. So Kareem, the RX-10, you've shown that you can get incredible results. Where do you think it lets you down that, that you know, you have to, what are the biggest obstacles you have to overcome with that gear on a regular basis? Things that bug you. Um, I think the rendering, whenever it's harsh light, I have a hard time coping. So I usually just shoot when it's a bit when there's cloud coverage and it's a bit overcast or early in the morning and late afternoon. But I know I could still do some good shots in harsh light. I just need to figure out because my I feel like the detail just doesn't render quite right, even if I underexpose for it and everything. Of course, like I talked before, the um, the autofocus I don't really I don't I don't really trust it. So I mostly use um, manual focus. Uh, I I only trust it with like short birds if I'm super low and I have like the background is super far off and I can, now I can trust it, but for birds in flight, it just comes off too often. So I'd like something a little better for that. And just to uh, preface, and, you're, you're not using full manual focus, right? I think, I think you talked about- It's DMF, it's called direct manual focus. So what it does is I have a, a small spot in my screen and uh, when I half click the shutter, it will uh, make a first uh, focus and then I can fine tune with the wheel and really fine tune the focus. So it, it focuses in the bracket and right. then I can fine tune it. So it's what I usually do. Um, it's pretty, well, I've learned to use it. It's not that uh, user friendly, but you, you know, you get around it and it, it's usable. Yeah, and one thing I like to do more is uh, low light shooting. I, I do low light shooting a lot, but I like to go even lower light than I do, and I will need a faster lens and a, and different gear. I think. Well, you, like you said, you, I mean, you're getting the results now, so I think, I mean, the work you're getting with the camera is really incredible. But it it yeah. makes sense, like knowing you and seeing your shooting. It's interesting, like what you value in a camera over what I value in a camera over what maybe Shea values in a camera. And, and I'm obviously I make these inflammatory videos about what the best camera is. <laughs> I mean, that stuff's not going to stop. Right. <laughs> but, but, but it, I really do think it's different for every person. Right. I mean, what on the Fuji side, Matt and I have talked about gear and uh, another friend of ours, who's, who's a great Fuji shooter for years. Um, his dream lens is the 200 F2. And while I drool over that lens, Real world, I don't think I'd ever buy it. I just don't see how I would shoot with it. I, I've got a mobility problem. I don't go hiking. Uh, getting close can be hard. For when, when I'm in the field, I don't want to go walking. I like to sit in one place. So I like zooms. So, so a fast zoom <clears throat> would be a dream. But I mean, I just everybody has has different tastes. So, I mean, but those are interesting, valid concerns for sure. I but it, but you clearly show how to work around them. So, so Shay, what about you on the R7? Now that you've had a how to go at it. What are, what are the quirks that when you eventually upgrade it, you'd be looking for? Uh, I mean, it's hard to say. I'm just <laughs> grateful for all the improvements I have now, but I think a couple of things that bug me, I feel like with, even with my six, the, the autofocus at something that it would just um, go past all that stuff. It, you know, the, the R7, and I think this is a general mirrorless issue likes to pick up other things that are in front of, of the bird. And so sometimes I have to like um, force the focus a little bit, um, which is something to get used to. A lot of the issues I have are just me not, you know, understanding this whole mirrorless world and learning how to, how to operate it. Um, and then, you know, making sure I don't, you know, enable stupid settings that will ruin my shoots. Uh, that, that's something I'm still getting used to. Um, I will say though, the, you know, I was kind of dreaming about noise improvement when I jumped to mirrorless, but 
understanding that I have a crop body, I realized it wasn't going to be as amazing uh, jump as I thought. So I, I am I am a little disappointed that the, the noise uh, performance isn't a bit better. I just find myself kind of in the same, usually pretty much the same noise tolerance that I had with my 6D, which, you know, was a, it's a little disappointing, but you know what, overall, can't really complain. It's the noise is actually still kind of nicer than uh, the, the 6D noise, and um, but there's so many other improvements that really I, I have little to to complain about now. Uh, maybe in a year from now, you miss my my top screen, and <laughs> that was always something <laughs> I I can't you know I, I'm still trying to uh, compensate for that. But um, you know with the EVF again, just you know stuff that is easily kind of overcome over right. you know from having a DSLR. So. Well, I mean, again, you guys have both shown you can get such amazing results with with the roughest pieces of kit. So, you know, I think it's awesome what you've done with not the roughest pieces of kit. And it's amazing to see little pieces of upgrading here and there make such a big difference. So, I, I mean, I want to thank you guys both for your time. I think we're going to try to make some semblance of this recurring. Uh, we've got a, a really healthy group of uh, photographers that we've kind of banded together to support each other and discuss. And, and I'll probably talk more about that down the road, but I, I really think finding community um, if, if you're a wildlife shooter anywhere, whether it's online or local or whatever, I, I highly recommend find people you can talk to. Um, I mean, even in what's this in, in the span of an hour and change, the light has has went off for me that um, I have special effects there. <laughs> the light, the light has been turned on that I really need to start using the histogram because even past the warblers, it occurred to me, oh, wait, actually, you know, last time I was out loon shooting, as soon as the sun came up, I definitely blew, you know, big, nice, big male loon. He's got the, holy, how white can I make it? Uh, and I ruined it. So I'm going to use that and I'm going to work on getting closer to some subjects to see if I can catch you guys. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to let you guys go, but thank you so much. And, uh, and we're going to link the photos to probably the Flickr group and uh, guys go follow them on Instagram. I'll have the links below. Uh, you you got to watch these guys work. So. And follow on Flickr too. I think you're both on Flickr, right? Yeah. Flickr Pro. Try to Thanks, put up Mike. something. Thanks, Appreciate guys. It, Appreciate it, Mike. Thanks, Have guys. Bye.